Okay. <laughs> Let's get started. I'm sure we'll have a few people coming in later, but I think uh, just in interest of time, we'll, we'll kick this off. So thank you all for joining us uh, here in this conversation around finite resources. Um, just to kind of set the context, just to sort of open this up, um, you know, it's, it's quite amazing that we have um, this incredible fourth industrial revolution theme that the, the World Economic Forum is, uh, you know, has highlighted. You know, this is a, this is a revolution that is, uh, you know, that's not just coming, it's already started. Um, a lot of people tend to think of the fourth industrial revolution as a virtual or a digital one. Um, but in fact, it's actually more tied to physical resources than ever before. Um, you know, if you look at some of the, the, the exciting technologies that are a part of uh, this revolution, um, you've got blockchain and you think of Bitcoin um, in the network consuming power at an annual rate of 32 terawatt hours, almost as much as Denmark as a country. Um, a single uh, circuit board that, or a single chip that goes into electronics contains, can contain often up to 60 different elements. 3D printing, which is disrupting manufacturing, is forcing us to rethink materials and how materials are deployed in distributed manufacturing. And so sort of if there is uh, you know, an underlying theme, it is that matter matters, right? And you can hashtag that and, and tweet that out. Um, <laughs> But in response to this exponential technology growth, global resource extraction has tripled in the last 40 years. Um, so it's just something that we really need to think about in terms of you know, how a business model is changing, how does policy need to adapt, what's the sort of innovation that we're seeing that allows us to keep up with this. And to have this conversation, I think we've got a pretty fantastic panel here. Um, you know, which I'll go through again. You guys have all of their bios, but I'll highlight a couple of uh, key things about everyone. To start with, my name is Priv Bradu. I'm the CEO of a company called Blue Oak. We're an urban mining company, and I am the co-chair of the Advanced Materials Global Futures Council. Um, over here, I've got Jean-Pierre Clemadieu. I'm sure I butchered that, oh, but <laughs> he's the CEO and chairman of Solve in Belgium. Um, there, Solvay is one of the 10 largest chemical companies in the world, and it was founded, as I learned, in 1863, mm -hmm. so more than 150 years ago. They're obviously doing something right. Um, he is also the chair of the Governor's Community for Chemistry and the Advanced Materials Industry. Next to, um, to Jean-Pierre, we've got Aaron Kramer, the president and CEO of BSR, Business for Social Responsibility. It's a global not-for-profit organization that aims to build a just and sustainable world. Um, Aaron is also on the Global Futures Council for the Consumption System Initiative. We've then got Benedict Sobokta. Uh, he is the CEO of ERG, the Eurasian Resources Group in Luxembourg, which is one of the largest diversified natural resources producer. And he is the co-chair of the Global Battery Alliance, which is really exciting. And then finally, we've got Ajay Marthur, the director general of the Energy and Resources Institute, Terry in India. And he's actually a member of the Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi's Council on Climate Change. So with those sort of brief introductions, I'm actually gonna start off with you, Ajay. And again, you know, I'd love for this to be a conversational um, uh, panel. Um, Ajay, Prime Minister Modi said in his opening address that climate change and carbon emissions are one of the biggest challenges facing the world today. And in fact, you were the Indian spokesperson at the 2015 climate negotiations in Paris. So in this conversation about a finite uh, resource constraint, how, you know, can you set some context? What does that mean to you? Well, in the climate context, in the energy context, I think there's nothing better, uh, no better example than to look at renewable energy. Across the world, renewable energy, which essentially means we don't use coal or oil, is becoming economically viable. There's a long history behind it. There were long years in which renewables were a uh, piece that very few people adopted, but very, very soon everybody understood this is something which is desirable, it's aspirational, even if I cannot do it today. 
And it has led to the point today where industry is leading the revolution in, on the one hand, enhancing demand, and on the other hand, through that process, reducing prices, so that you and I today can say that we are willing and able to invest in renewables. So to me, this is a success story. It tells us that renewables have now the very distinct chance of becoming the energy source, or at least the electricity source of the future. And a lot of coal and oil may remain in the ground. Thank you, thank you, Ajay. Aaron, any, do you have any perspective on this? Again, just in framing the question, what does it mean to be in a world of finite resources? So um, it's a great question, because I think some of what we need to talk about is about business models, is about um, you know, the tactics to change the way business is done, change our use of resources, but a lot of it does have to do with mental models. So if, if, if you hear me say we've got limited resources, you're going, to say, you're going to think immediately, I'm going to have to make do with less. And especially at a time in the world when uh, prosperity is becoming more possible, more available to more people than ever before, that doesn't really work. It also sends a message to business that you have to reduce your ambition. So that is not a path that anyone is very excited about. In fact, though, I think we want to talk about a world with better use of resources because, in fact, uh, that is what is going to open up opportunity for us as a global community. It's going to open up opportunities for innovation, but it also improves uh, our lives um, as individual consumers and citizens. You know, one example I like to use is um, a power tool. I don't think anyone here manufactures power, power tools. The average power tool that's sold in the United States is used for nine minutes. Hmm. So we can talk about whether they're stranded assets in terms of fossil fuels. That to me sounds like a stranded asset, one that's sitting in my uh, garage at home, actually. So we, we can think about better ways to deliver value, better ways to derive value, and, and I think that's the big opportunity. Awesome. You mentioned business models, Aaron, and, and I want to turn to you, Jean-Pierre. Um, I just read that Solvay and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation have signed a global partner agreement raising the group's opportunity to contribute in accelerating the transition towards a circular economy in the chemical sector. Very exciting, basically. So, you know, just given your, your, your vision for this um, and Aaron's point around business models, how do you think about business models evolving in the context of finite resources? It's a, obviously a broad question, but... No, no, it's, a, it's a broad question, but maybe just uh, sharing uh, a few thoughts, and it's funny that you I was not planning to... Uh, Go back to 1861, but yes, indeed, Solvay was founded by uh, uh, by a Belgium inventor Ernest Solvay, and uh, Solvay was founded because at the time uh, soda ash uh, was very important because soda ash is a key raw material to produce glass. So glass industry was uh, was booming, and the existing process were uh, uh, had a very important environmental impact, using sulfuric acid, creating a lot of issues. And as Ernest Solvay came up with what chemist would call an elegant process. And for a chemist, an elegant process is a process which is effective, where you make the best use of your raw material. And Solvay started in this, uh, in this process. We, uh, we've came a long way from this, and uh, indeed today Solvay is turning, is transitioning from being a chemical company to an advanced material slash chemical company. And half of our business today is material, advanced polymers, composite materials which are used in markets like automotive, aerospace, smart devices, and, uh, and a few others. And yes, indeed, we've uh, realized that uh, uh, using well the resources for economic reasons, uh, the end of the day, energy has a cost, raw material uh, have a cost, which has been the priority for many years. And again, if you think of the chemical industry, we've been very good at putting together clusters where the, the waste of one company becomes the raw material of, a, of the one sitting next to it. But we need to go to the next stage. Mm -hmm. And the next stage, indeed, is circular economy. Mm -hmm. And the Helen MacArthur uh, Foundation is a nice story because I met Helen a year ago, just out of a friend's suggestion here in Davos. We discussed, and I was impressed. I, I knew the, the sailor, but I didn't realize that she has put with her foundation a, a very strong, let's call it a think tank, but it's think and action tank, uh, working on these issues of uh, uh, circular economy and sustainability. And uh, after uh, this discussion, I came back home saying, wow, there's really something for us to do. Uh, and yes, indeed, I mean, when you sell today a product to the automotive industry, recycling is part of the discussion uh, for obvious reasons. When you sell 
material to an aerospace company, a little bit, not as much as, uh, as automotive, but it's coming. Uh, when you sell a key component to a smart device producer, it was not part of a discussion. Recycling or circular economy was not part of a discussion uh, a couple of years ago. It's now a top mm -hmm. item. And this year in Davos, I have uh, 15 or uh, yeah, 15 customer contact. I'm sure that in half of this contact, the question of circular economy will come on the table. Yes, so for us, it's very important. Uh, it's very important for some of our uh, customers. It's very important uh, in the development of new technology and, uh, and solution. And uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation is just a way for us to have other ideas, to have challenging stakeholders in front of us who help us make progress in this, uh, in this field. That's really exciting. Uh, Benedict, uh, you know, just given sort of the, the scale of your company, I mean, you guys are obviously um, at the heart of a lot of existing materials uh, and elements that, that go into so many different parts of, of the revolution that we've been talking about. On the business model side, you know, are there things that you're seeing that you're excited about uh, in terms of how business models are evolving in the context of finite resources? Well, before I come to the opportunities, I would like to maybe offer to you, maybe we start a little Uber for drilling, mm. drilling <laughs> machines in the US, because this sounds like a sharing economy yeah. opportunity. Exactly. Um, but uh, I think when we talk about finite resources, something that a lot of people don't understand is the global economy is growing, the global population is growing, and so is the consumption of raw materials. We haven't had a single year with the consumption of raw materials. I'm not talking just oil and gas and copper and what, whatever, has not been growing. So global consumption, just because of population growth, of demographics and increase in per capita wealth, is growing. Now, add to this new technologies, and you suddenly get these spikes in demand for products that no one anticipated on the producer side. So the electric vehicle revolution, I think, is one of those I've been looking at. There's others as well. Um, now, we are particularly exposed to the electric vehicle uh, because we produce materials that go into batteries for electric vehicles and also into your mobile phone. So next time you hold your phone, think of me. We produce a little bit of what went into your mobile phone. Um, and we do that in a sustainable fashion. Um, and I think that's, that's what, what people have just underestimated, the sheer scale of the transformation through distributed energy, uh, renewable energy, which comes very much uh, together with distributed energy. Uh, and of course, the electrification of mobility has an enormous impact on the demand for raw materials. Um, a factor of, I'll give you an idea today, um, today the whole electric vehicle industry consumes about 200,000 tons of copper. That's one mine, right? <coughs> now, if you assume and believe the forecasts of, uh, of the International Energy Agency, they assume the number of automotive uh, vehicles powered by electric batteries to grow by 100 times. Mm. Now, now you're talking about a, a large percentage of global production of copper that is produced just for electric vehicles, and it's not there, it doesn't exist. It needs investments, and it needs the construction of a supply chain that's sustainable, because a lot of the products that are currently produced, particularly for batteries, they're not produced in a sustainable fashion, artisanal mining, child labor, horrendous things that we see, particularly in Africa. One of the things that triggered our initiative with the global battery lines to make sure that as we move into this transformation in the electrification of the world's industry and mobility, that the supply chain that builds up, and we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of business, so that brings us to the opportunities, mm -hmm. is actually produced in a sustainable fashion. Um, so that's an, a very exciting opportunity, but a lot of work still has to be done. Absolutely. Now, obviously, one of the things that sort of frames these conversations around resources, which by design are contained within sort of national borders, right? Um, and, and they're obviously subject to discussions around policy. Um, Ajay, what is your perspective of, you know, wh where does policy need to go? Where does policy need to be? in order to really sort of step up uh, or, or step up the conversation around resources? Well, let's take some uh, examples. When, as soon as we start talking about newer technology using fewer resources, when those technologies enter the market, they are more expensive. And then you and I say, this is too expensive, we will not use it. What has worked for example, is a business model uh, which, and this is, was used for LED bulbs in India. So on the one hand, it aggregated demand. 
And then it went out and on the other hand, did bulk procurement for those large numbers. The first bulk procurement they did, they got LED bulbs at $5 each. The sixth one that they did, they got it for about 60 cents each. 300 million LED bulbs have been <coughs> sold. Short point, policy that helps in creating demand on the one side and at the same time increases competition, brings in the private sector and helps in price reduction on the other hand is a very powerful tool to push for resource efficiency. Can I add one thing that I think gets over, overlooked in, in discussions of policy? And this was something I learned here this week. 20% of global GDP is public procurement. Yep. So governments not only you know, create and enforce regulations with their spend, they have an ability to help uh, shift markets. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't even get into the subsidies that we know exist for all sorts of things, from agricultural commodities to, to minerals and, and, and fossil fuels. So government's got a lot of tools in the toolkit. Erin, thank you. Um, Jean-Pierre, do you have any perspective? I mean, you, as, as someone who's sort of a, a participant on the business side, uh, is there a policy that you see is regressive or could be progressive? No, sure. I mean, uh, I was uh, asked a few years ago by the European Commission, what can we do uh, to develop a circular economy? And my first answer was about regulation. <coughs> be careful. I mean, once you have labeled something as waste, moving it across border, including national border within EU, becomes extremely difficult. Absolutely. And when it comes to uh, recycling, I don't want you to think that circular economy is just recycling. Circular economy is much broader than that. But part of it is indeed recycling. Uh, when we go into, a, I would say, a more complex, higher value added product, we need to be able to concentrate in one place to treat a significant amount of this so-called waste. And once we have regulation which are making the movement of waste very difficult, and I fully understand why we need to control that, but we have created situations where it's very difficult to um, collect waste across border. So mm -hmm. that's just one example of where regulation could make your life easier or more difficult. Now, you, if you take a, a different stand, it's very obvious that in automotive industry, once again in Europe, where there is a, a minimum recyclable content which is compulsory, pretty high, by the way, uh, probably currently around 95%. Uh, it's a very, it will help align the supply chain to provide the technology solution, which indeed will make recyclability possible. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to go into sort of now, because we talked a bit about sort of the policy context, a little bit about business, business models. But I think the thing that's really exciting uh, you know, in, in this conversation is the role of technology and innovation. And, you know, I want to highlight that, you know, technology can sort of, and innovation can span um, policy. You can have innovative mm -hmm. uh, or innovation in how you can deploy policy. You have innovation in how you make supply chains more transparent. You have innovation in materials. But what I want to do is actually go around the group and sort of see what are things that each of you are saying on innovation and technology um, that is really exciting to you. I'll start with you, Benedict. Oh, that's that's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> Give us one or two. <laughs> we had a great session yesterday at the at the governor's meeting for metals and mining, and there was a, a gentleman who presented uh, some three D printed metal parts, um, and that's quite fascinating how you can actually mm. decentralize supply chain because industrial revolution historically has been about economies of scale, big plants, mm. big operations, and then moving it from one factor to the other to the next one that's got enough scale to produce cost competitively. Now, I think that is going to just disintegrate global supply chains in a positive way. Um, but I think, again, we're not, we're just underestimating. It, it, it will still require a lot of raw materials to produce the same parts. It doesn't change. It's just the way you then treat those materials. It doesn't change. So, so the, the demand of materials, we, we're just underestimating how much more is going to be needed and how poorly we're actually equipped today to produce those materials. Because the per capita consumption of, uh, of raw materials is, we're, we're, only, we're only seeing this, the peak of, like the little piece of the, of the iceberg, because a lot of countries are still a tenth, mm -hmm. a twentieth of, of resource consumption of Europe or the United States. I mean, India is a very good example. And, and you can have the most incredible technology uh, down further down the value chain. It does not change the fact that all these countries, right. as they grow, as they become richer, we need more materials. And today we have no idea where that material is going to come from. Absolutely. Aaron, what do you see? Well, I'm actually going to tell you about what I'm eating, um, <laughs> because uh, at lunch today, um, we had um, a Thai beef salad 
from Impossible Foods. It's absolutely, it's a wonderful product. The story of how it was developed, though, is fascinating. So a Stanford biochemist on his sabbatical um, said, I want to get after the question of meat because we know that uh, meat uh, creates uh, methane emissions, very, very, very bad, takes up a lot of land, water creates waste, and so on. So he identified uh, the chemical that, called heme that people knew was in beef, um, but it's actually the thing that makes beef taste like mm -hmm. beef. So it's the thing that causes us to like beef, for those of you who like beef, I do. Um, and so he used his sabbatical to try to figure out a process to, pr to produce heme <coughs> vegetables. And it's a, an absolutely marvelous product. And a, as he says, we like beef. We don't necessarily like beef because we associate it with the animal from which it came. Um, and so we just like the taste, the sensation, the cost. So that, and the answer there, I think, is that a lot of solutions are hiding in plain sight. So this was something that was known, but the application of it wasn't. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, re that's actually really, um, uh, I'm a vegetarian or a preferred vegetarian, so definitely like where that's going. <laughs> um, Ajay, is there is there anything uh, that you are seeing that you are really excited about in well, technology? Well, one of the things that I see happening is the increasing role of the user in moving towards resource efficiency. If we are able to create an aspiration amongst users, and I've given you the example of renewables earlier, if you're able to create an aspiration amongst users that this is a preferred option to move to, then we can get a lot of change. The key issue is how do you make differentiation happen? Uh, how do you make the case that this widget is more resource efficient than this widget? They look the same. What it means is that there is a label, a brand, a certification that allows people to visually differentiate between this more resource efficient widget and the less resource efficient widget. That has been immensely successful. For many years, I used to run India's energy efficiency program. And like many other countries, we discovered the huge value of star labels. What did they do? You know, an air conditioner looks like an air conditioner, whether it's efficient or not. But what the label did, it, it allowed you and me to make a conscious choice. And in 10 years, the air conditioner sold in India is about 40% more efficient than the one sold in 2007. So these can be amazingly useful. So differentiate and see how we can use the aspirational norms amongst people to build up a demand for these more resource efficient products. And, and actually, let me just ask you there, Ajay, do you think, you know, this a little bit ties back to policy. I mean, do you, do you sort of see that these are materials and or, or mm -hmm. things containing these materials should be subsidized? Or should we be expecting mm -hmm. people to pay more for it? Okay. That's where the earlier example that I gave, gave comes in. Subsidies distort the market. Mm -hmm. The best is to have a system, and the LED example was a great example of how Initially, the aspirations were created, the price was higher, so people who were willing to be early adopters took it. As volumes increased and prices decreased, then a lot more people were willing and able to use it. So the price reduction mm -hmm. has to be part of the process. Mm -hmm. And it is my belief now, based on the uh, examples that I've seen, that good business models can help us overcome the problems which were previously solved by providing subsidies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a really good point. I want to come to you, Jean-Pierre. I, uh, again, read somewhere that you signed an agreement with Boeing for the supply of advanced composites uh, and adhesives that go into the 777 uh, yes. airlines. Um, so that's, that's, that's really exciting. On this advanced materials front, right, as we sort of think about uh, new materials that can sort of disrupt uh, the previous ones or actually make them more circular, you know, what are examples that you're seeing that are really exciting to you? Well, I, I can give three examples, and uh, what they have in common is that technology is just one element of the equation. At the end of the day, the, uh, the way the overall supply chain works and the, uh, the behavior of the, uh, of the end customers are important. Uh, one e first example, we are using uh, as a natural 
polymer in a number of formulations for our customer, a product coming from India which is called Guar. Mm -hmm. Guar is produced by uh, millions of very, very small farmers in, uh, in some part of India and we have developed with the support of uh, two of our customers, L'Oréal and Ankel, a program to help uh, these farmers use good agricultural practices and we are now using blockchain to make sure that we can secure the integrity of the, uh, the chain. Second example, I'm not sure I can so name the customer, but a big soaper came to, the, uh, uh, came to the conclusion that he needed to develop shampoo formulation, mm -hmm. which could be used uh, in places where access to water is very yeah. difficult. Yeah. And uh, we were chosen to partner with, uh, with this company uh, to develop this concept. I mean, how can you give the same experience to the end user when they have a, a fraction of the amount of water that we are used to use in our shower in the, uh, in the morning? And a third example, very different, this is uh, B2B. We are a large producer of uh, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And uh, the concept uh, so far was to build bigger and bigger plants, 50,000 tons, 100,000. We are currently at uh, 300,000 tons for the largest one. But uh, an important segment for this market are uh, paper mill. And paper mill tends to be uh, uh, in quite remote areas. And so we had to have an area of trucks to bring this product to the, uh, uh, to the paper mill in the middle of Amazonia or in uh, other remote places. And then we came up with a completely different concept. Can we do a mini plant which could fit in a container, which could be put on the customer, uh, on the customer uh, plant, producing exactly what he needs? And we were able to launch, uh, to build the first two uh, such units, which are being used uh, by uh, a couple of our Brazilian customers in, uh, in Amazonia. And that's a a very different way, but to create something which indeed is resource efficient. Jean-Pierre, I love guar bean vegetables, <laughs> and I'm having more and more of them every day before the, I, they're priced out of my reach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I actually just want to sort of add a, a, a perspective there uh, and, and step out momentarily from my role as moderator to say that, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting about um, uh, the circular economy and how we think about resources is that by design, um, you know, what used to be considered waste, but is, is sort of these, are these urban resources are generated locally. So when you think about sort of centralized manufacturing versus distributed manufacturing, mm -hmm. there's this really exciting opportunity when it comes to jobs, when it comes to sort of, you know, bringing employment back, bringing sort of user preferences back within local economies uh, that is enabled by... Uh, this the circular economy thinking. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I want to sort of transition just briefly, Aaron, into consumer behavior, right? How, you know, are there things that you're seeing um, on the consumer behavior that helps shape this conversation about resources, you know, where they will be go going in terms of either the materials or, you know, as, as I was asking before around business models? Well, I mean, it, 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 it's a, a fundamentally important question. It's a little bit like policy in that there's lots of different answers to it because, in fact, there are lots of different consumer cohorts out there, and you get different behaviors in different parts of the world, different age cohorts, et cetera. That said, I think there's one overwhelming truth that is beginning to be uh, addressed, which is the massive amount of waste, not just in the production and distribution process, uh, but also uh, at, you know, at consumer level. So in the United States, and the numbers are similar, a little bit better in Europe, but in the United States, a third of the water, a third of the food, and a third of the energy is wasted. Mm -hmm. So that means that, uh, you know, th that's a big part of, uh, of the uh, household expenditures for a lot of people. So it's only, if you assume that that's, say, again, a third of household expenditures on average, that means everyone is coming home and throwing into the fireplace one-tenth of mm -hmm. their income. It's absolutely crazy, and I think that's where, where some of the technological solutions come in because we can begin, particularly on energy and water, mm -hmm. we, can, can, we can begin to be much better informed consumers um, and create a more efficient system, and then those materials can be used for others because your point is 100% right that there is this inexorable demand for more resources. This is a way to free up some more resources, mm -hmm. save people money, and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's uh, and that's if I can just build on that, Aaron. Is uh, you you've made a lot of good examples, but they're, and they're they're all correct, they're, but they're anecdotal because I think we we do not have st enough statistics data 
or natural resource efficiency of what we consume, whether that's in an electric vehicle or mm -hmm. examples you made. And I think that's a role that the forum can play. I think the, the, the Water Alliance is a perfect example of where they actually started the analysis of what's the cost curve and what's the benefit curve of water. Mm -hmm. So a liter of water in one country or for that application, what does it actually contribute and how much does it cost? We don't have that yet for a lot of the things that we consume. We don't understand what the CO2 footprint is. We don't understand what the labor footprint is, what, what the economic footprint is, the ecological footprint. We just don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And then that's, for example, on the global battery lines, that's one of the areas we're going to focus on to try and understand exactly what does it take along the, and I don't like the word value chain because it means we've got an, a beginning and an end, so along the value cycle maybe mm -hmm. when they call it, um, what do you actually, what does it take to bring it to where you actually can then consume it so you can take choices as you said, but for this you need data, you need research mm -hmm. and that's very important. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I just I, I want to sort of touch on something that Aaron said on the food side, which is I just heard uh, a couple of days back that just in the food wasted in the world, that generates about eight to 10% of the world's carbon footprint, <coughs> just in the food wasted, blew my mind. Um, I wanna come back to you, um, Benedict, just on this point around, um, I think the, the supply chain or supply cycle as you called it, um, and really sort of try and get a sense from each of you, starting with you, Benedict, around the risks that, you know, that we're seeing in and around resources, and I'll, I'll state one, uh, factoid that I remember coming across in my work about seven years ago, which was that in order to produce a single wind turbine, it takes the amount of neodymium that's extracted from about 2,000 tons of neodymium ore. Um, and so when you really look at sort of clean tech, and I think that's mm -hmm. absolutely essential, the growth of clean tech is essential, but you know, is there this sort of risky, dirty, unsustainable side to it that we really need to be thinking about? Benedict. Yeah. It, it you're absolutely right, and if you were to see how neodymium is actually produced, I think you, you would have some sleepless nights, because it's a very dirty process in some very poor parts of China. Um, now, you're absolutely right, That's the, I call it this the, the overall footprint of a, an end product that people believe gives them a good conscience. So if uh, my wife takes her electric vehicle to car to drop off the kids at school, she feels good about herself. But if you then think about that, the material that's produced to actually make the battery or the powertrain uh, may be produced using child labor in the mm. DRC, which is a fact, right? About 20% of the world's cobalt is produced in artisanal mines in the DRC, which employ between 50 and 60,000 four-year-olds and eight-year-olds. Right, so it's shocking, but, but it's that conscience that people like and they want to feel good about it, but there's no data actually to give people the choice that to understand that there's a difference in, in whatever goes in your product. Is it produced in a sustainable fashion? Is it environmentally clean? Um, and it's, uh, that's, that's exactly what we have to raise <laughs> consumer awareness that there is a difference. There are different types of raw materials and there should be a choice and that choice is not just from the end consumer, but it needs to start from the beginning. To the, to the end of, uh, of the cycle and then go back into the cycle because the cheapest natural resource is the one that's recycled, mm -hmm. right? If technology plays along, right? There's some things that at the moment cannot be recycled efficiently, um, but the, most, the cleanest, the most effective way of adding another ton of material is trying to recycle the one you've already produced. So we had a good session on, on yesterday, on, again, on batteries. And um, there was the CEO of uh, Umicor, who is a, great, a big producer and recycler of materials for, for uh, elect electronics and, and batteries. And he gave me a shock, he gave a shocking statistic about 40% of the world's batteries are, are, are not actually recycled, or 50%. I mean, a lot of people have got five, six, seven mobile phones at home. That, that's valuable stuff that's just lying around and we're not using it. That's the cheapest resource you can find, is just bring in your mobile phones and recycle them. I think the, the issue with that is, uh, you know, we get a lot of people saying, hey, can we get mobile phones recycled? The problem is one of pricing, right? Like the, the issue is at what price can you afford to recycle stuff? Um, and I think um, often what ends up happening is people sort of end up going to the lowest common denominator because that's cheaper. And the price doesn't reflect the, the price that all of the stakeholders have to pay. Exactly, because it doesn't account for the the Negative collateral costs. damage. Exactly. Correct. It's not priced in. It's not priced in, right? And so, uh, Jean Pierre, you know, any any perspectives on risk? Uh, oh, plenty. I mean, plenty of risk. Uh, like any uh, business development, uh, sometimes we fail. Just to give a, uh, what I think is an interesting example, uh, Solvay is quite active in rare earth uh, formulation. Rare earth are uh, one of these uh, rare metals which uh, are found in very very uh, small quantities on. Uh, 
uh, in the earth crust, and most of it is coming from uh, China. There was a big crisis uh, some years ago because China was trying to uh, to play a bit with uh, with this position. They are being used in a lot of applications from automotive catalysts, uh, low consumption lamps, and uh, uh, catalyst over industrial catalysts, and a few other things. So we decided that the prices went up. We decided at the time to launch a recycling process. We've developed a chemical process. We've invested uh, about 20 million. I shouldn't be too proud of that. You'll see in a second why. To build a plant in France to do it. Uh, and we started. And then suddenly we've seen prices dropping <laughs> because other mines have opened. Uh, and we have to realize that, in fact, our business model was not consistent anymore. And we had to close our recycling facility. So short-termism, uh, clearly, is, uh, is something which is, uh, which is a risk. Again, I think it's, uh, it's good to fail sometime in business because if you, don't, if you never fail, it means you're not taking the risk. But it's a case where I think we are bringing probably a good solution for a problem which will be there for quite some time. And at the end of the day, we have to say, okay, the world is not ready for that, mm -hmm. so let's, uh, let's move to something else. Mm. Ajay, what, what, are, what are the risks in your mind? So I'm going to look at a very, very different world of risks. In India, the vast amount of waste material uh, goes ultimately to landfills, but in the process, there's a huge amount of unorganized, uh, uh, let me use the word rag pickers, who draw out any useful material from that before it goes to the landfill. As we move towards re formal recycling, this large group and it's a very large group, millions of people, they started losing jobs, and it created a political problem. Mm. Now, the issue, of course, is how do you marry the two? And uh, therefore, the thoughts that are being today considered are, one, to address your point about the fact that it is not uh, economically uh, viable, is to create a tax when you buy, for example, a cell phone, which goes into a fund so that when you return a cell phone, there's a little amount of money that comes to you. But what it does, it just pays for the supply chain for the collection of the old cell phone. And the second is if there is a part which is not met by the recycler through the sales of whatever he is able to come out, it meets that cost. That's one. And the second is that the rag picker system is upgraded by training those people and providing them facilities where it is far safer to deal with these kinds of materials than even if it is today. However, you can imagine the kind of uh, effort, the kind of public sector and private sector uh, uh, and logistics that have to come into place for either of these two things to become effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Aaron? Well, a similar thought. You know, you, you mentioned uh, relocalization of manufacturing enabled through new technologies that, you know, smaller scale production bring closer to, to markets. And that does create unintended consequences. I think you could imagine a lot of uh, consumer products being manufactured again in Europe, again in the United States. That's going to put a lot of people out of work. And um, I think the, the other way to think about this is the fourth industrial revolution is taking place in the context of a lot of other revolutions. So the energy and climate revolution, that system is changing uh, massively. Our demographics are changing massively. And all of these things mean that you have economic dislocation. And there's a speaker on the agenda tomorrow afternoon. I forget his name. Um, I think he comes from Washington. And who um, Florida. made, Florida. sorry, Florida. from Florida, that's right, <laughs> uh, that's right, um, who, uh, you know, made a lot of political, uh, yeah. developed a lot of political capital out of parlaying this, these dislocations into uh, something that, at least in my view, is probably not beneficial for the overall world economy. And so I, I, I think there are micro effects. You know, you can have uh, people in Bangladesh as bad as the conditions are in the apparel industry there, per, per capita GDP has quadrupled over the last 30 years because of the apparel industry. Um, and the microphone is now coming closer as well. Um, uh, the, uh, and um, these are jobs that are going to be lost, and it can create a downward spir spiral with both micro uh, problems and macro political problems. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll, I'll actually add to that and say, you know, one of the things that often plagues me in, in the world of business is, 
there's this there's this purpose incentive at, you know when you're a business for the problem that you're trying to solve to keep persisting mm. right um, and so the question I mean and what it really takes is for people to want to disrupt themselves to actually want to cannibalize themselves for true advancement to happen um, you know I'm gonna sort of maybe get Jean Pierre and Benedict to, to talk about that you know how are you disrupting yourself so that you don't sort of keep falling back to the easy answers. And then after that, I want to open it up for some questions. Well, I mentioned it a little bit earlier on when I was talking about our partnership with the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's clearly a way for us to have someone who can uh, challenge us and, uh, and disrupt us. Now I have to say that our customers uh, tend to challenge us and disrupt us <laughs> every day. And our own team, I mean, uh, when we have situation uh, where uh, clearly we are not uh, uh, let's say working properly, uh, we see a lot of internal challenges and all of these are very good and uh, my only personal commitment there is to make sure that I'm open to, this, uh, I'm open to these challenges, uh, but I can uh, promise you that uh, I don't like challenges and, uh, and that's good because we progress out of, uh, of this. And what's important by the way is to, do, is to have probably a nice balance between the short term ones, the longer term ones, there are cases where we can bring an answer quickly, there are other cases where we need to develop uh, solutions and uh, uh, business model technologies to answer to this. But yes, I mean, we need to be open to challenges because we know that uh, the challenges, some of these challenges will bring opportunities and uh, others will bring uh, viability for us just to work better. Benedict? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I believe what um, we've achieved now with this Global Battery Alliance um, is actually is an innovation in itself because it brings together the entire chain of people that usually don't talk to each other. I mean, yesterday, but automotive producers, technology companies, battery manufacturers, chemical companies, mining producers, traders, there was a group of people that never meets, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which was exceptional. So if you take a systems approach to trying to address such a major problem, such as ramping up the supply chain for the electrical revolution, uh, I think this, this in itself is an innovation. Um, now, we obviously want to have more impact and we want to move faster because the world is running a lot faster than everyone has expected. Um, but I think we, we really, and that's where the, the, the forum has been incredibly helpful, is, is we need to use the platforms that are available to bring together the players in such a chain to make sure there is a sustainable approach to actually achieving all these revolutions that we want to achieve. Because there's no doubt we all want to make sure that there's less CO2 emissions and less uh, violation of human rights. But it's only that public-private partnerships together with companies that are operating along the value chains and sometimes are competing. Um, actually work together to, to improve this. And I think that's, um, that's, that's I'm quite proud of how, how this has really taken off. Fantastic. Um, questions from the audience. So then is there anything that, uh, that people want to sort of bring up that, that hasn't been raised? Everyone seems very satisfied <laughs> from everything you guys have said. There's a question there. On the last comment about this uh, alliance across the whole supply chain, I'm very interested in what it took to accomplish that. Well, we started about uh, two years ago. And I think it was, um, it, it started with an immediate, very visible problem, which was the child labor issue in the copper belt, uh, which is where the majority of, of the cobalt for the industry is actually produced. But when we started looking at, at this, this particular problem, we saw, this is a much bigger issue. Right? This is about an entire new supply chain that hasn't existed. We have to build it and we have to make sure it's sustainable. Um, and I think uh, the forum then was, was really leveraging all its, all its, its infrastructure, its contacts and networks uh, to bring the players together um, in a fashion that was, was very neutral. Because one of the issues you always have in these, these cross-industry organizations is, is there's competition, there's a bit of distrust, um, there's people competing for new business models. And unless you've got a, a, a platform like the forum, which is connect as a mediator, uh, where people come together and, and uh, actually try to find a solution, it's, it's very difficult to bring it together because most industry associations work like silos. Mm. So I attend so many mining conferences where I only see mining people. Yeah. That's great. I love the boys. I love the guys. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a few here. Um, but usually you don't meet with the CEO of an automotive company. I think that's very unusual. And that's been part of the success, I think. Mm. Great. Any any other questions? Um, I work for a reinsurance company, which means two things. There's a lot of assets to invest, and a lot of people wanting to regulate us. And a new <laughs> wave in regulation is 
um, seeking for us to divest from all fossil fuels. Will that make a positive difference? Anyone in the center? Aaron, I well, I, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to start. Look, I, I think um, uh, it's it's an idea that began as a political idea, mission-driven idea, and is gaining more and more acceptance as an economic idea. And I think, um, you know, not all fossil fuels are the same. Um, the trajectory of change, it, it's clear that there is going to be a trajectory of change over the coming decades that will make a lot of fossil fuels uneconomic. Uh, the, the rate of that change is a little hard to predict, but the direction of travel is clear. So I think five years ago, you did not have as many mainstream financial institutions taking decisions to reduce their exposure to fossil fuels. There are uh, a number of institutions now that are doing so, and they're not doing so because it, you know they're actually Greenpeace in a uh, financial institution's close. They're doing it because they think it's the right business decision. Some of it, of course, is reputational, but, um, but the stakes are too high financially um, to do it only for that reason. So uh, I, I think the direction of travel is clear. Ajay, do you have any? Actually, I kind of echo what Aaron said. The key issue is the economic obsolescence that is increasingly hitting the coal industry, for example, and will move to other parts of the energy value chain. I am always a little hesitant when politics is brought in on economic uh, decisions. The, but the hard fact is that if the regulation says and possibly you already have regulations, which says, look at what you are reinsuring. What, are the, what is the future for this? Will it continue to deliver the kinds of economic revenues that you are looking for? Then to me, it is irrelevant whether specifically coal is mentioned or not, but that should be part of your normal processes, as I'm sure it already is. So I am, as I said, I'm a little uncomfortable in bringing political issues uh, into pure economic decisions. Benedict? Uh, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I remember a session we had a couple of years ago here in Davos when, uh, when the economists come to our governance session, they talk, and I always love that. I mean, Mr. Hausman was just here, he left, he was one of them. Um, and he said the, the purpose of, it wasn't him, but it's somebody else, he said the purpose of trying to extract funding from the fossil fuel industry is to make sure there's less investment in fossil fuel, which will make the price higher over the long term and ultimately would make the whole, the whole industry redundant because there'll be alternatives, right? It doesn't work. The majority of today's funding in the extractive industry comes from China and from US hedge funds in the shale gas industry, right? That's the majority of the funding that today goes into the extractive industry. So, so it's not gonna stop just because a pension fund is forced not to invest because those are not the kind of money that we're talking about that goes in the industry. I think what really should happen is, is, is that the funds should, maybe there should be an allocation of, you can invest in fossil fuels if you also invest a certain amount in alternative fuels. And here I'm talking about the high-tech fuels, the, the, how do they call them, the, the clean fuels, the algae-based fuels. The, because actually, what is a fuel? It's just, it's, it's solar energy stored in plankton, mm -hmm. right, 200 million years ago. So it's actually not complicated. It's just a way to harvest solar energy and store it in liquid form. We can, we can actually recreate that. It's not complicated. At the moment, it's just the energy balance doesn't work. It's just a question of time. The same way it will take time, it has taken time to bring down the cost curve of the solar industry. Um, you mentioned the LED bulbs. Uh, the same can happen with, uh, with uh, the alternative fuels. It's possible. jean you, you want to make a point? You yeah, know, just a... Uh, uh, I would probably would not put all the fossil fuels on the same basket. I think in the case of coal, uh, it's clear that the fact that a number of institutions uh, have taken a strong position and not willing either to insure or to invest in a coal-related project, I think it has helped realize that we have a very significant issue uh, regarding coal. Now I tend to believe that uh, uh, we need oil, we need gas for some specific application where they are very difficult to replace uh, in the visible future. So that's, uh, I think, pass I happen to be on the board of AXA, so uh, which has taken a strong position uh, there. Relatively easy on coal, in a, in a very different field, very easy on uh, 
things related to tobacco. Uh, not so easy if you want to be a bit more picky and say, okay, I'll take, uh, I don't want to invest in shale gas or I don't want to invest this or that. I think we are creating a bit of a disruption. But on coal, I think it has been a, a very good wake up call. Uh, and yes, indeed, I'm continuing at Solvay to use uh, coal uh, for probably good short term reason in a number of our plants, but uh, I see that flashing. Uh, uh, I see a red light flashing in front of me uh, regarding this subject, and I, need, I think we need to speed up the, uh, uh, the transition to different types of, uh, of fuel. So I think on coal it has been helpful to have this message coming from uh, various players. So I have a question actually for each of you, and in the meantime, if there's any other questions in the audience, uh, do, do raise your hand and then we'll get the mic to you. Um, one of the concerns that I have um, is that, you know, in the sort of the really bright and shiny world of, uh, of this fourth industrial revolution, how do we make materials sexy, right? How do you get sort of the brightest minds, the, the young bright minds sort of working and solving some of these challenges uh, when everyone's sort of trying to build or tokenize something or everyone's trying to build the next, you know, AI solution to X. Um, so, you know, with each of you, like, how do you get more diversity? How do you get more women, um, you know, in this conversation? Um, and how do you get, how do you get sort of the, the, the smartest and brightest people working on this? You know, I'd love, love each of you to, to, to share something on that. I can, I can start if you want, but uh, no, I think uh, first we need to, if we want to attract this bright talent, uh, both genders and a lot of diversity in terms of uh, origin, we need to show them that we are contributing to solve some of the problem that the planet is facing. I mean, this is really the, strong, the best argument to bring bright mind into, the, uh, into our organizations. Now, the, uh, this revolution is bringing... Uh, incredibly exciting new ways of working. I was visiting one of our labs uh, in France uh, last week. I mean, a chemical lab is uh, more and more, I'm not saying this is the case today, but uh, uh, it's not really the place where do you use your test tube to, to try things. I mean, we can model incredibly mm -hmm. in a very, very sophisticated way uh, what would happen in a process, and then the lab experiment is just to confirm what we've been uh, modeling before, and it allows to do much more uh, activities to try much more solutions because we can try them on a computer using the latest of what uh, artificial intelligence and uh, data mining can allow us to do. And, uh, and I can continue. I mean, now uh, when we bring a new, uh, a new product into an airplane, I mean, a lot, of the, uh, uh, a lot of the safety tests have been done electronically, digitally. So it allows, again, to test much more solutions. Mm -hmm. So I think we have something very attractive to offer to the young and bright minds, and again, if we can uh, convince them, and they are challenging, it's a challenging public, and it's good, because it, uh, that's another part of the point I was mentioning in a previous answer. If we can convince them that indeed we are working for profit, but we are also working because we think we have a contribution to bring to some of these challenges, I think we have uh, the ability to bring them. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, as an aparte, I think in, in our case, uh, a bit more women, would uh, be useful to make sure that we are effective. <laughs> Not just to be nice with women, but just to make sure that you need, I'm convinced that diversity brings efficiency. So we, if we want to be uh, very efficient, very creative, we need a much more balanced uh, workforce than that we have today. So I keep that as a, as a challenge for Solvay and myself. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I, I will share again two things that I heard in that. Uh, there's a construction company, a, a software as a service, a SaaS construction company that just raised nearly a billion dollars from SoftBank, I think, last week. So again, really exciting. Erin, um, uh, you know, what are you seeing in, in making this sexy? Well, um, I, I would just build on what, what Jean-Pierre said. I think that um, it's interesting that the term moonshot is now a generic term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it started out as an actual moonshot. Um, now it's, you know, in the United States, there's talk of the cancer moonshot. So I think the great project of the 21st century is delivering prosperity and dignified lives to all of the people on this planet. That's never been true. It is within our grasp. And, you know, materials are one of the ways that, that we will get there. So I think it's, it's using that inspiration, a purpose, yes, materials, but beyond materials, that will attract the best and the brightest. Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's the holy grail. I think uh, no one's really cracked that how to make the industry more attractive because, uh, of course, we're not, we're not Silicon Valley, right? We're a dinosaurs in many ways. 
because what we do is not very much different from what was done 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, now, with, particularly with more automation, artificial intelligence, and big data processing of some of the operational data, we actually now have the opportunity to centralize some of the operations that we used to do decentral. Now, if you go to a typical extractive industry site, it's in the middle of nowhere. Right? So people go on rotation and then they come back. Uh, right? If you work on an oil platform, you don't live there with your family, which makes it very, very difficult to have a good lifestyle. So people work on rotations and they tend to be men. Right? So now with, with more things moving to a headquarter, because you can now monitor so your operations mm -hmm. from literally from any basement you like, if, as long as you've got a fast internet connection. Uh, I think this will make the, the attractiveness of the industry um, significantly better for both women and men because I'm not, I, I don't really make a difference it's about the skills. And when you look at people with skills, particularly in IT and engineering, they want to do something exciting, right? And a lot of them don't want to work in Arctic conditions or, <laughs> or, uh, or even worse places. Ajay, what, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Benedict. Well, first of all, I want to, I completely agree with what Jean-Pierre and Aaron and Benedict said, and let me build on that. You know, what really excites people if, there is around them a universe of thought that, for example, in this case, materials is the way we will save the world. You know, this has happened multiple times in history. And most recently, I think it happened with renewables, when a lot of young people got into the renewables business because they thought it was saving the world. And I would suggest that they have been successful. It also happens that people get in and then they are not successful. The nuclear industry is an example. We drew in the best and the brightest and uh, didn't get us anywhere, my, my views. So short point, creating a thought verse, short, shorthand for universe of thought, creating a thought verse where materials, better materials is the aspiration of the globe helps bring in both bright minds and diversity. Second, how does this happen? It happens because we're able to communicate the fact that when you have, when you have products which use less materials, it's good for you as a consumer, it's good for the planet. So the two sides have to be communicated. The narratives that we have all discussed need to be brought out. Uh, Jean-Pierre gave an excellent example. The issue is how do we get every young person or even not young person to know about these so that they can be excited by them and make life choices depending on the kinds of stories that they hear. Let me just do one example that I forget to use. It was a, it's a great one, it's Solar Impulse. Solvay yes. was the, uh, the first sponsor of the Solar Impulse uh, project and Bertrand Picard, by the way, is. Uh, uh, is attending the WEF uh, during this session. It's an incredible demonstration of what materials can do. I mean, this plane can fly around the world without a drop of fuel, thanks to a lot of polymer composite uh, materials that most of them have been, been developed by uh, Solvay, by the way. And it's very, very powerful. I mean, when we present Solar Impulse or Bertrand Picard in front of our teams or in front of young audiences, telling them this is what material science is about, this is something which helps uh, attract these, uh, these talents. Hashtag matter matters. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thanks Thank for you. the conversation. Thank Thanks you. for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.